afternoon. Um, welcome. And uh, so I am Tom Hickman, if you haven't heard from me before. Um, and I am the Chief Executive Officer for Tualatin Valley Water District. Uh, my tenure here started on August 1st of 2019. Uh, so I, I still consider myself relatively new um, to the district. And uh, certainly it's been a year and a half full of excitement and challenges. Um, so this event is uh, being recorded and will be put on uh, YouTube for those who can't join us today. Uh, we encourage you to ask questions in the chat. Uh, we will answer them at the end of the presentation during the Q&A session. All right, next slide. So, um, TVD, TWD, TVWD, we have a number uh, of focus areas that I have um, in managing the operations here. So, you know, what we do fundamentally every day is we deliver a safe, uh, clean, reliable water supply. And that, that is our fundamental of why we exist and, and what we do every day. Uh, but to get that done, um, we have a rather significant capital improvement program uh, that both both deals with uh, what our future needs are as well as what our existing needs are uh, and addressing the, the uh, existing infrastructure that we have to repair and replace. Um, the WWSS or the Willamette Water Supply uh, System is uh, supply system. It, it's it's a significant investment that we are undergoing currently and have been for some time. Uh, this project started many many years ago, and we're going to be talking more about that in a bit. Um, but it's it's really a big driver of what we do every day right now. Uh, and then of course uh, finance, billing, and customer service functions. Um, we, we have to be able to uh, talk and work with our customers and help them. So uh, that is a, a big part of what we do along with delivering water every day. All right, let's talk a little bit about our structure um, from a very big picture level. Go ahead to the next slide. So um, from a big picture perspective, um, we have, there's there's nine FTE in the administrative services. 
Um, and you can see that the bulk of our staff are down in the customer service, engineering and operations, um, and then uh, finance and the Willamette water supply. So, um, and then we have 10 in the IT group. So uh, just to talk uh, a little bit about that. So customer service, um, not only do they uh, you know, deal with all the billing and talking to our customers um, and assisting our customers, uh, they're also the ones that are out reading meters, uh, doing repair and maintenance on the meters uh, so that we can ac accurately read those. Um, and so there, there's quite a bit of staff that are involved there. Uh, and we are also embarking on a very large project right now. We have a pretty uh, antiquated uh, technology that we've been using for our customer service, um, uh, you know, IT side of it. And so we're up, uh, up, we're upgrading that to uh, a program that is much more modern, much more flexible uh, that we hope uh, when we launch in a little over a year here, uh, that uh, will uh, provide our customers some additional flexibility and opportunity to, to enhance their ability to work with the district. Um, our, our engineering and ops are the people that keep this system running every day, uh, and that's why they're here. They make sure that the maintenance is being done uh, and the repairs of the system uh, are happening. Uh, our finance folks are busy trying to keep sure we're staying on track uh, with our budgets and uh, how we're spending our money. They, they help provide a check on that um, and making sure that that uh, money is always being spent appropriately. So they provide the oversight um, and they also oversee all the purchasing that we do. And then, of course, the Willamette Water Supply Program, uh, which is uh, the $1.3 billion program that we're managing, but we're partnered with other entities on. And we'll be talking about that in a moment. Uh, but the 14 staff that are involved there, there's actually quite a few more because we work with a number of consultants that are also helping us implement that program. Uh, and then the IT makes sure that we are staying uh, secure not only up to date with our technology, but they're also making sure that we are staying secure uh, so that we don't have people get into our system uh, and and manipulate it in any way so that um, if many of you have probably heard of what happened in Florida, I believe it was last week or the week before. Um, and so we make sure that we don't have that kind of uh, breach of security. All right, uh, next slide. So um, some of our fiscal realities for 2021, um, one of the things that we saw uh, through 2020 um, is uh, a decline in water sales, uh, and it was a significant decline. And certainly that impact our but bottom line budget. Uh, one of the challenges that poses is that um, the cost to maintain and, and have water ready and available to everybody 24 hours a day, seven days a week, our costs don't change significantly as a result of less demand. So our costs remain the same while our revenues decline. Uh, and so that that's a challenge. Uh, it's a serious challenge that we're facing. Um, and uh, it's something we're working with our board of directors on. Uh, the Willamette water supply uh, program and uh, the Willamette intake facility costs uh, both have increased, but they've increased within expectations. So there's not, it's not that uh, there's a big surprise there, but, but they have gone up and uh, you know, that also impacts our bottom line. And then uh, the need for additional uh, capital projects on our existing system is increasing. Uh, we have a number of line breaks, uh, frankly, every week. Um, so uh, the crews get on those fast and, and they're able to repair them. 
but there gets to be a point where some of these just no longer make sense to repair and we got to start talking about replacing those. And certainly uh, there's a growing reality of more of that repair uh, or replacements than repair side of things. Uh, and as I mentioned before, we have a very limited ability or flexibility to reduce our operational costs. So uh, despite the amount of water we're delivering, we still have to be here to have the system pressurized. Uh, we still have to make sure that the pumps and the valves and all that still is operational and that requires staff uh, to do that. So. Um, you, you're, it, we're not uh, we're not like some supply and demand things where when demand drops, our need then to um, uh, have staff to help us theoretically would also drop, and that's not the case uh, with water utilities. Um, and then continued investments are needed to increase organizational performance and reduce costs. So. Uh, we need to continue to make investments on technology side of things uh, to help us be more efficient. Uh, so similar to what uh, we talk about with our customer information system, our CIS, uh, that's a big investment we're undertaking, um, but it will allow us to be far more efficient in the future once that's up and running compared to our current billing system, which is, which, which is pretty antiquated, as I mentioned before. Um, okay, so let's jump to the next slide. So what are the tools that we have to manage our spending and our budget? Um, well, we can reduce spending by delaying select projects. So this is something we're currently working with our board of directors on. We're looking at what projects um, potentially make sense in postponing or delaying. Uh, while we also um, don't increase the district's risk. Uh, so we, we were constantly in this balance of looking at what's the risk of delaying something versus spending the money. Um, and so that's something we're working with the district uh, board on uh, to see what makes sense, where there's a balance there that we could potentially delay some projects to help us with our current fiscal situation. Um, and specifically what we're looking at there is some select elements of the Willamette water supply uh, system. So we're, we're looking at what elements there are potentially viable candidates that we could maybe delay. Uh, we don't know yet um, if there are any or the, any that will make sense. Uh, but we're, we are in the process of looking at those and considering those. Um, and there's, there's the operational factor we must consider, the financial benefit uh, as a result of a delay or financial cost uh, or impact uh, of delay. And then there's the water quality piece. So all three of those have to essentially work in order for us to say, yeah, we could delay something. Um, you know, we, the, the other one that everyone's aware of, uh, but nobody likes, is uh, to increase revenue by raising rates. Um, this is uh, something that, as part of any business, we, we have to keep up with the cost of inflation. Uh, but when we're dealing with materials that often exceed the cost of inflation, uh, so the cost of steel, or pipes, those kinds of things can, they, they often exceed uh, the, the cost of living that we often see. Uh, so we do need to increase rates um, to make sure we're adjusting for that and helping uh, pay for uh, these, these projects that we have. Um, there's a lot that goes into that. We look at providing generational equity, uh, meaning we look at making sure that costs uh, aren't too burdened on just one generation that we try to spread these out uh, over a longer period of time through bonding and other creative financing mechanisms. Um, the other thing, the other tool that we have is to modify the rate structure. And so uh, currently about 23% of our revenue comes from fixed costs. Um, the remaining uh, uh, portion of our revenue all comes from 
uh, the um, variable portion of uh, the bill and meaning uh, tied to how much water is used. And because we are taking on so much uh, debt right now to do the Willamette program, this is a little bit troubling. Um, and we are going to be looking in this next biennium for taking a look at our rate structure and look at considerations for possibly modifying that. Um, our board will be heavily involved in that. Uh, and we will also be working with the public and communicating with the public what that would look like if we go down that road. Um, so uh, there are some uh, delay or elimination of potential programs um, or operational investments that we're considering. Um, so, you know, these are programs um, internal to the district uh, that, you know, we consider very important, but we can certainly look at scaling those back. Um, I don't know if any of them, if we could out and out eliminate uh, but there are many that we're looking at. What can we do to scale back? But the reality is for us, while we look at those, our costs are really heavily tied to our CIP and to the WWSP project, the Willamette project. Um, that is the overwhelming bulk of our costs and it's the biggest uh, driver in, in rates. Um, and then uh, the other thing that we do uh, regularly, in fact, I was on a phone call early this morning, um, we're looking for opportunities for grants and low interest financing. So we're constantly looking for what opportunities exist for getting, whether it's federal or state grants uh, or, or funding um, to help cover any portion uh, of our costs. So that's that's an ongoing thing. And, and we'll talk a little bit more about that here also in a moment. Next slide. So uh, we're currently working on the financial plan and, and some of the highlights uh, that you'll see here is that the decisions we make um, really shape the next 20 years. Um, so this, the decisions that the board is facing right now they're big, tough decisions, and they really will shape things for the district for the for the next 20 years. Uh, you know, our flexibility to change course in the future, and, and literally, I, I, in a year from now, uh, our ability to change direction it, it won't be there. Um, we are at the apex of the construction. Uh, for the WWSP where we start letting out um, many, many contracts. In fact, uh, I believe we have 12 contracts uh, slated for this year uh, to be put out to bid on. And once we have those contracts, there's an obligation by the district to complete that contract. Uh, so once we enter those contracts, our ability to change uh, in the future becomes very limited. Um, what this results in is a period of heightened risk and uncertainty. Uh, so if we have, like we've seen, uh, reduced revenue combined with these large uh, uh, capital projects, um, it puts us in, in a, a tough spot um, where we don't have a lot of tools to, to address that um, once these projects are underway. Uh, because again, because of the scale of those projects, our operational budgets are, are a tiny fraction compared to the size and scale of those proje uh, projects that we're contractually obligated to commit. Um, so uh, the long-term financial planning uh, enhances flexibility. So um, that is what we're looking at. Uh, we we were very successful, and again, I'll talk more about this here in a moment. In getting a WIFI loan, uh, the WIFI loan that helps us in the future. So once the project's complete and we start making these loan payments and paying that loan back, um, we're paying it back at a much much lower interest rate than what's available uh, on the market. So um, you know the the. There's good news in front of us, but we have some challenges uh, uh, right in front of us uh, immediately right now. 
Um, so let's jump to the next slide, please. So some of the focus areas that um, I will, you know, that I, I, I find myself spending a lot of time on. Uh, so certainly um, legislative, uh, both at state and federal, but the state level currently, uh, I believe there's about 3000 bills uh, that are moving through the legislature. Uh, I believe something like 180 additional bills were dropped, uh, I believe yesterday. Um, this is something we as our staff, we monitor these, we, we look to see what impacts they potentially have. Uh, and then we work to develop, uh, you know, what kind of, do, do we need to provide any written testimony, oral testimony? Um, do what agencies, what other partner agencies do we work with? Uh, so we look and to see, you know, um, do we need to be working on uh, statewide or is it a regional issue? So we're, we're looking at all those from, uh, from a legislative perspective. Um, certainly on a federal level, uh, there are always changes there um, that can have impacts on us. Uh, so we're, we're constantly looking at that in terms of water quality uh, and other regulations. Um, and we look to work with our federal delegates uh, to make sure that these are something that um, both are necessary and that we can do. Um, so we, we, we work closely there so we stay pretty well uh, tied in to these, both the state and federal level uh, on a political level to know what's going on. Um, we have a lot of regional partners. Um, the, the regional partners uh, consortium. Um, so we, we realize that while we provide water to, you know, a finite area, we're also tied to city of Hillsborough, city of Beaverton, um, the Portland system, Portland Water Bureau, it's where our current source is from. Um, and we can supply water to Tiger. We, there's a number of places that were tied together. So we, we all collectively realize it's in all of our best interest to work on a regional basis and work together. We also work with clean water services. Um, we handle all the billing for clean water services. Uh, and uh, we coordinate with them uh, where it makes sense, uh, whether it's reaching out to the public or uh, coordinating on technology. Uh, so they're involved in our customer information system uh, and we work closely with them on those kinds of things uh, to make sure that they're in agreement with what we're doing and, and that where it makes sense to share costs, we do. Um, as I mentioned before, uh, we work with the city of Hillsborough who manages the Joint Water Commission uh, and that's one of our other sources of water. Uh, so we work with them uh, regularly to, to make sure that we have adequate sources, that that infrastructure is also reliable and up to date and can, can make sure that we deliver water. Uh, we are working with the city of Portland on the water purchase agreement. Um, so uh, the current agreement that we have with them uh, is slated to end in 2026. We're tying that to the completion of the Willamette project, but we're going to need an agreement um, beyond 2026 uh, in part because what we want is this interconnected system for the region. So we will have the ability once this project is complete, we will have the ability to actually provide uh, a portion uh, of Portland's customers with water should should we be in that situation need to uh, or certainly if we were in a situation where something catastrophically occurred that we needed uh, some additional supply we could continue to get that on an emergency basis from the city of Portland. Uh, we work closely with City of Beaverton. Uh, City of Beaverton is a partner uh, on our Willamette project along with uh, City of Hillsboro. Uh, and of course, a lot of the work we do is within the city limits of City of Beaverton. Uh, so there's a lot of coordination efforts that go on there um, and working with both their elected officials and with their staff. Um, 
And then uh, the the uh, Willamette water supply system, um, we have uh, three primary owners. So Tualatin Valley Water District, we're the managing agency for that project. Uh, but then we have City of Hillsborough, who's a partner with us on that, along with the City of Beaverton. Uh, and then we're also having discussions with others who believe maybe now it might make more sense for them to participate on that project. Uh, so we're, we're having those kinds of, of discussions. Um, as part of that, the what we refer to as WIF, the Willamette Intake Facility, uh, that has a number of owners um, involved as well. Uh, and uh, we'll talk more about that, but that's an expansion uh, of actually the Wilsonville treatment plant um, and their intake facility uh, that we're coordinating with them to get this overall project done. And then we also have the what we call the WRWC and believe me it ha I'm used to acronyms and it has taken me a while uh, to get comfortable with all these acronyms um, but that's the Willamette Rivers uh, Water Consortium uh, so we there we look at the water rights and water supply that many of us are dependent on, on uh, from the Willamette River. So next slide, please. So uh, this is just a, a graphic image uh, of the general overview of the Willamette water supply system. Uh, what you see in black uh, are the major elements of that system. Uh, that The black lines there are primar primarily pipelines uh, that total about 30 miles in length. So it's a lot of pipe. Um, and uh, we have a lot of it to be putting in the ground in the next few years. We've gotten some in, uh, but we got a lot more to do. It also uh, comprises of a water treatment uh, facility that will provide high quality water uh, and address all of the water quality issues of concern from the Willamette. Um, and we got to build that plant uh, and get that operational by 2026. And then we also have uh, these large finished uh, terminal reservoirs, finished water terminal reservoirs. So when the water coming out of the treatment plant, it goes into these tanks and then out to the distribution systems, uh, feeding, uh, feeding us and our partners. Um, so it's, it's a very large, ambitious project. It's a project that's been going on for many, many years. Uh, decades in the making um, and it, it's an exciting time uh, to be part of this uh, where we're actually getting to the point that uh, we can we can see the finish line uh, on the horizon now that this will be a reality and and it will be operational and it is a key component to providing uh, some uh, stability in terms of our supply in the event of a large seismic event. The entire uh, Willamette project is being built with seismic considerations so that we can continue to deliver water even after a significant seismic event. Next slide, please. So I mentioned uh, these before. So we, ha we have the Willamette uh, water supply system. We have the WIF, which is the Willamette Intake Facility, and then uh, the WRWC, uh, which is the Willamette River Water Consortium. And uh, you can see the partners there in this diagram. So uh, this, this requires lots of dialogue. Uh, to keep this all moving and to keep it all moving forward. So there's a lot of meetings, a lot of coordination uh, to make this all happen. Uh, but you can see right at the center of that Venn diagram is Twelfth and Valley Water District. We, we are at the heart of all of those. Um, and so that puts us in a pretty unique spot uh, to be able to um, really uh, take care of, of running this this entire project and coordinating these three entities uh, for the benefit of the region. Next slide. So some of the benefits of the partnership that we have are the economies of scale. So obviously we get to share the costs 
uh, of this very large project. Um, and frankly, it wouldn't be possible without doing that. Uh, so um, that that is a huge benefit and it's more than a benefit. It's an absolute necessity uh, that we coordinate and work with our partners um, to make sure that we can share the costs uh, of these projects. Uh, how those costs are shared and allocated is very complex. Uh, it's it's not a straightforward, uh, you know, a third, a third, a third. It, it's based on future needs um, and and a number of other factors. Um, and so all of that uh, we goes into looking at each element of the project to see how we allocate various costs. Uh, roughly, uh, TVWD uh, is responsible for 59% of the total costs. Um, with the uh, city of Hillsborough uh, being responsible for the bulk of the re remainder and then uh, Beaverton uh, responsible for about 5%. Um, the other thing that this does is it allows us to share the risk. These large projects are inherently risky. Uh, there's no way around that. And so uh, being able to have multiple, multiple partners involved lets us share in that risk so that no, no one entity is taking on all this risk alone. Um, and then there's savings through the fact that um, we all own this asset in the end. Uh, so we share the cost of operating this system uh, in the future, which again, the more we can spread out those costs, the better it keeps everybody's costs down. Um, and then enhance system operations uh, by reducing duplicate infrastructure. So uh, we look to make sure that, you know, we, we try to make sure that we're not, uh, you know, there's one thing you, you, you want redundancy, uh, but duplication is a bit different. So, you know, putting multiple lines in the same road doesn't make a lot of sense. Uh, and it, it rarely makes sense to do that. Um, but having looped systems where water can be supplied from uh, multiple directions, um, that kind of redundancy is a critical benefit and, and uh, it's, it's really smart uh, water planning. Um, and, and the system connectedness uh, is critical to maintain regional service in, the, in any disaster. Uh, so we've seen this, uh, in fact, this last summer with the fires, um, we worked together on a regional basis to look at how we could reallocate water supplies um, based on where the fire was headed. At one point, it was threatening the Bull Run watershed, so we were in conversations with the uh, city of Hillsborough and, and the JWC. Um, and there was the number of those kinds of coordinations that were going on to look at how we could shift uh, resources around. Um, but we, we've seen it again even last week uh, when we had this recent ice storm and, and winter storm uh, where uh, intakes and pumps, those kinds of things were freezing up. Uh, um, we have a lot of redundancy again that where we can shift water uh, around um, to make people whole. We have equipment uh, like generators that we can bring in and get power back up and running when there's a loss of power. So all of this is critical for the region um, when you consider that for all of us to be able to live here, to work here, for businesses to be able to thrive here. Uh, the most fundamental thing that is needed for them and us to do that is water. Uh, without water, without a reliable water supply, uh, none of us can do that. Uh, they, a, a, a reliable water supply is absolutely fundamental uh, to having a strong economic base. Um, and Washington County has that. It's very fortunate to be in that spot. Uh, and so, um, and it's again, I, I'm very excited to be uh, in this opportunity to be leading this organization during this time. So let's go to the next slide. And I think what we're doing here is uh, really turning it over to any of you who have questions. Uh, so um, I think 
and Andrea and her staff are going to be monitoring for any questions and let me know if there are any questions for me. Excellent, Tom. Excellent, Tom. We, have, we have quite a few questions in so far. Um, the first one is from Andy T. There are, uh, oops, I'm getting out of order, but it is from Andy T. Uh, he's asking, my sewage rate is roughly two thirds of my bill and it seems to be at a record high. What is being done to reduce these charges? OK, Tom, you're giving us a great answer, but you're muted. You know, uh, I, I was so eloquent there, and it's the second time I've done that today. Um, so great question. Uh, we we don't uh, manage the budgets for clean water service, um, uh, clean water services. Uh, we 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 have nothing to do with that part of it. What we do we do handle the collections or the or the billing side of things, um, because it makes sense not to have that whole duplication of staffing, and and um, so it actually lowers costs for us to to be handling the billing side of it. So I, I would encourage you to uh, reach out to Clean Water Services. Uh, I know they take their fiduciary responsibility very serious, as we do, uh, and they are, are very capable and competent people that can can tell you what they're doing to address um, their future rates and 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 their future costs. OK, and the next question is also uh, for you, Tom, with your financial struggles, how do you prioritize repairs, capital project plans and IT upgrades, you know, in, in the light of the lower revenues? Uh, so uh, a great question, and I'm going to probably rely on some staff here to, to help me answer this. Um, the one thing we have I, I've been very fortunate in my career to work with some incredibly talented teams, and I got to say the team here uh, is, is phenomenal. And I bring that up because um, the the team here, this is something that they look at constantly. They're looking at uh, what do we prioritize? Um, what can we hold off on? What are the consequences and risks of holding off on any investment? Uh, so that's that's a constant evaluation that we undergo. We're certainly undergoing it right now as we're going through the the budgeting process currently, and and looking at what are those risks by postponing. Um, we have a number of tools at our disposal uh, that we use. Um, some are quite sophisticated uh, modeling tools that we use to to take a look at uh, helping us under identify what the risks are of particular failures uh, or consequences of, of any failures in the system. Uh, and and uh, we, we do a num number of different types of simulations to, to understand what those are. Um, so I, I'm going to ask if I got Pete on the line here. Pete, uh, would, is there more you'd like to add to this? Um, so I, I will, Tom. and. Um like you said, it's, it's all about prioritizing and executing and I'll, and I'll try to think of an example um, that, that will help bring it together. But what we try to do is, you know, look at the things that absolutely have to happen in order for us to fulfill our mission of delivering safe drinking water. Um, and, you know, how many staff and, and what other resources are, are those things going to take? And, and if we have limits on those resources, um, you know, what are the things we're going to do first? So if, if we were faced with an emergency response type scenario where we had, um, you know, multiple line breaks um, that we're going to have to go out and fix, uh, one of the first things we're going to do is, is look at the impact of those individual line breaks and, and how widespread are, are the outages um, and the customer impacts. And, and much like, you know, PGE and other utilities have to do and when they're facing a similar situation, um, you're, you're trying to, to fix the the biggest ones first, the, the ones that will get the most customers back in service, um, and then you can work your way out into the into the uh, the ones with a, a smaller scale impact. And so um, that's an emergency response scenario. You know, we do the same thing with long range planning, and when we're trying to uh, time the upgrades that need to happen to different facilities, 
Um, you know, and, and, and those can be harder because the risks uh, aren't as acute. You know, you, you don't know uh, when something might fail. You know that you know what condition it's in, you know how long it's it's been in service and what repairs it's needed, but um, we don't have that crystal ball to know when, when things might um, go out of service or have failures. And so uh, we do use a lot of tools. Um, you know, we we take maintenance and um, you know upkeep of our equipment very seriously and, and try to time those improvements to, to where we get the most bang for our buck. But um, yeah, it's it's a constant evolution um, and, and we're always uh, trying to do the best we can with the resources we have. OK, thank you, Pete. And I just think for our audience, it would be important to note that Pete is our water operations division manager. So he oversees a lot of our crews that are out there turning valves and and making your water system work on a day to day basis. OK, back to Andy T and uh, don't be shy, you know, throw those questions in the Q&A. We, we this is the whole point of these is to to meet you with the information that you'd like to have. So Andy wants to know there are several threads on Nextdoor where neighbors are perce perceiving record high water costs. Do you work with social media sources to identify areas that may be having unusual charges? So uh, we do monitor Nextdoor and, and another, a number of other uh, social media feeds. In fact, Andrea uh, and, and Frank and Justin, who are all on this, um, that, that they, they watch that. Um, and when it makes sense for us to respond, uh, we certainly do. Um, and we try to address those things, uh, we, especially if there's stuff about unusual charges. Um, you know, we try to we try to respond to quickly uh, because that can create a lot of angst. Um, and as you know, there's there's a high potential for misinformation. Um, because our bills cover both us and clean water services, uh, there's, a, there's a lot of misinterpretation of what's driving what, what, what are driving the costs. Um, what I am going to ask here is, uh, so Andrea, do you want to talk a little bit about what we do with social media and how we monitor and, and to respond to these kinds of things? Sure, I'd be happy to. Um, and there have been some really great, great um, stories where one of the things that's different about Nextdoor than any of our other social media platforms is that a neighbor can start a thread and unless they tag us in that, we're really not aware that they're talking about their water bill or talking about us. And so the way that the neighbor you know, creates that post and the privacy level really determines whether or not um, we can engage. But we do um, have a lot of great engagements on Nextdoor. A lot of times it's on evenings and weekends when somebody will be out of water or experience some kind of outage and we'll be able to um, get that to our after hour service and, and try to pass those messages on. But I think just as a, a general rule, we really want customers to call us on our customer service line, which is 24 hours a day, 365 days a year. If we're not there to take that call, then we have a service that does that and then dispatches those calls to our duty. So we're here for our customers all the time. And that number, we'll put it in the chat, is 503-848-3000. And if it is an after hours and we're closed and you press one, then you can bypass and, and get straight to um, our service to get your help out there on the street. I think another little important thing about Nextdoor is just to say that a lot of customers have reached out to us and said, hey, we saw this on, and it's concerning in my neighborhood. And then we'll be able to have them post or we'll then be able to search. And if the privacy settings are, are good, we'll go ahead and engage. But we do really use that as a listening tool. And I think these forums have really enhanced our customer relationships in that same way. We're not, we want to answer your questions. We want tough questions, you know, challenge us. We get better when customers challenge us. And social media, I think, is a great tool to do that. We're also on Twitter, we're on Facebook. Um, we've been exploring a little bit with Instagram um, because we do have some really great photos. I hope you caught that at the beginning to really get a picture of you know what gets buried in the ground and you can never see again you know we're trying to show that in that venue but social media is great um until it isn't and then and then we just have to try to you know work out our our problems with with people and we do have customers who get upset with us and 
And but we really are here for you and we want to work with you directly to, to resolve any differences we might have. So thanks, Tom, for letting me tackle that one. Um, we have another question and our finance people are really in the middle of budget right now, so they, they weren't able to join us today. Um, if we don't answer this question adequately, you know, just put it in the in the question there and your email or your phone number. We won't publish that for everybody, but we'll get back to you. How have you have you identified the reasons for the reduction in water usage? So we have. Uh, we, well, we think we have. Uh, um, so the bulk of the reduction is actually on the commercial side. Uh, so um, you know, businesses that have had their doors shuttered now for a while, um, or maybe not shuttered, but at a much reduced capacity. Um, they, they've obviously reduced the, their water use. Um, so we've also seen though uh, a reduction on the residential side, which is a little bit confusing uh, in all honesty to us because more people are home. You would think there'd be more water use, uh, but um, you know we, we did see a reduction, uh, not quite as much as what we saw uh, on the commercial side, but certainly reduction there as well. So um, that's where the big reductions are, are, you know, coming from the actual, you know, what what makes people use uh, less, uh, you know, it, it that's deeply, you know, personal as far as what, why, it, what's motivating them to use less. Um, but, uh, but that's been the, the bulk has been from the commercial uh, and, I, I can't remember the percentages, but uh, the, the bulk of it has been on the commercial side. Okay, and uh, boy, we always get such great questions. So thank you for keeping those coming. Um, we also have a question about resilience. Um, how resilient is the water system for situations such as the cold snap in Texas, earthquakes, the big one, and the loss of power in storms? And we're gonna let, um, Pete Boone, again, our water operations division manager, take this one, and then he's going to turn it over to Robert Witham, who's our emergency preparedness coordinator. Okay, yeah. So the 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 problems that were widely publicized in Texas um, with first the failure of their their electric grid, um, and then failure of of a lot of their their water infrastructure. Those two things were tied together. So um, the the grid went down. Um, a lot of water systems, including ours, re require a lot of electrical power to move water around. So, so just running electric pumps um, to lift that water into the up, upper elevations. Um, so they they had issues with being able to move water around. Um, they presumably had backup power generators like we do at a lot of our pumping facilities, but fuel management becomes an issue um, not, too, not too long after those. Uh, those generators have to start up because they burn a lot of fuel. Um, so then you you have a, a cascading issue. Uh, the other the other problem that they had down in Texas was a lot of pipe breaks, um, both in homes and also in in their distribution system as well. And I think that's uh, a lot of that is because they just weren't prepared for the cold weather. You know that's not a, a typical weather pattern for that region, and so their their design and construction standards were not. Uh, probably uh, up to par with what they needed to be to handle those those freezing temperatures. So um, compare that back to our system. So so we face power outages on a fairly regular basis. We had um, 13 of our facilities uh, lost power over over the, the weekend when we had the, the storm here. Um, so that's why we have backup power generation. We we have um, systems in place to to manage fuel deliveries and, and keep our facilities working even when when the grid is down. Um, we also have plenty of experience with cold temperatures and so you know our, our pipelines are are designed and constructed to withstand that as are a lot of our customers homes you know with pipe insulation and and uh, things like that. So um, you know we we were impacted by that storm but it didn't impact our, our ability to deliver service to our customers. So um, good good things there. Uh, Watching what happened in Texas is is a, a bit of a preview for us. I think um, you know when you do think about uh, the large earthquake and uh, different natural disasters that that we are likely to face here someday. So they had a lot of main breaks, you know, which um, 
reduce their ability to to move water around and also to just to hold water in their system. I mean, they they lost pressure in, in wide wide areas of different cities down there, and so um, that's something that that we are trying to prepare for here as well. Um, and I'll, I'll talk about that a little bit. So. Uh, with the Oregon Resilience Plan, that was a, a statewide study uh, looking at all kinds of infrastructure that, that might be impacted by um, the, the Cascadia subduction zone earthquake. Um, we did a, a focus study coming off of that Oregon Resilience Plan. We did a focus study on our water system uh, to try to estimate what impacts uh, a large earthquake would have. And we've got a long term uh, capital improvement plan that's geared towards uh, mitigating some of those hazards. We've made a lot of progress on that already in, in the form of uh, upgrading facilities such as uh, storage reservoirs and pump stations um, and the the next phases of, of that capital improvement plan are going to focus on our transmission piping. So uh, being able to move water from our, our resilient supply, the Willamette water supply, um, out to critical parts of our system you know, we serve a couple of large hospitals. We've got to be able to get water uh, to those facilities and then across the rest of our service area to the rest of our customers. So, um, like I said, we've, we've done the studies. We've we've got a lot of progress made. There's a lot more to do. You know, this this uh, seismic improvement plan is a, a it was when we started in 2015, a 50 year planning horizon. Um, and that's just because it's a lot of money. We've got to spread that spending out over time so, so that it can be affordable to our customers. Um, so again, we're, we're thinking about it. We've been making a lot of, a lot of uh, progress on that and, and we've got more work to do, but we're, we're uh, headed down the right path. The short answer, Pete, is that we, we don't face the same risk that happened in Texas, that's for sure, correct? <laughs> yes, yeah, we're, we're lucky in that respect. Yeah. OK, Robert, do you have anything to add to this resilience question? Yeah, just a bit. Uh, yeah, that was a really great answer uh, by Pete. Uh, just to add a, a, a bit to that, one factor for our resilience uh, status is also um, we we train and exercise um, for scenarios just like this. Um, uh, we we take information from other areas like the Texas disaster and we've we meet, we discuss what would our status be if something like this happened? What do we need to do to make sure that this doesn't happen to us? Uh, uh, what type of measures can we take? Uh, we, we really work with a lot of our partnering agencies, including the um, uh, electrical facilities like uh, PGE on um, exercise disaster uh, training and plans. Uh, we just had one um, last year that was a major uh, 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 power outage scenario, pretty similar to what happened in Texas. Um, and uh, we connect and work, coordinate with our um, uh, county emergency management and other emergency management around the area as well um, to make sure that we keep keep up to date and we're uh, that iterative process of making sure that we're always improving our emergency response capabilities. Hey, thanks. We will also put in an announcement here. Um, we have started sending customers who request it a monthly email of emergency prep tips because resilience is definitely one of those things that we're working on our side, but we need you to work on yours. So if you um, have emergency water stored, then you're going to be in a lot better condition while we're getting the critical infrastructure back up. And on case of the big one, we've had a forum on that specifically. It will take us a while to get water to your door. OK, and then Melody, um, she wanted to know that um, she said you stated that water sales have decreased. Is part of that due to all the business buildings being empty and restaurants being closed? If not, you know, can you explain why sales have decreased? So, yeah, as I mentioned earlier, um, what we found is it, it, that that's the big reason. Um, you know, that, that's the primary driver. But uh, like I said, we've also seen a degree, decrease in residential. Uh, and my my only assumption is, like all of us, we we are trying to be careful about what we're spending money on. And so people that could not water their lawn or, or make those kinds of choices uh, maybe didn't. 
uh, which would be the other part of that decrease. Okay, thank you. We uh, have one more question here about um, what effect, Paul B has a question, what effect, if any, does forest management activities have on your water treatment facilities? Uh, I can start and then, I don't know, maybe Pete can jump in here or I don't know if Joel's on here. Uh, but um, so uh, for us, because we currently, we currently don't have water treatment facilities. Currently, our supply comes from uh, Portland Water Bureau, um, and then the other portion comes from the Joint Water Commission. Uh, they do have treatment facilities, um, and uh, you know certainly we'd be concerned about a forest fire in either of those watersheds. Um, frankly, a forest fire in the Portland Water Bureau or the Bull Run watershed is would have a bigger impact than uh, a fire in the uh, JWC watershed. And the reason being is, is uh, the, the Bull Run source, um, that is not currently filtered. Uh, that is something that the Portland Water Bureau is working on, um, but they're still many years away from having a filtered source there. So without a filtered source, uh, you know, a, a fire in that basin would, would be uh, problematic and, and a challenge uh, to get through uh, where the JWC has a treatment plant and could certainly filter out uh, the ash and sediment loading uh, as a result. Um, and what I, one of the things that I can tell you is um, I worked on a, on a water uh, treatment facility uh, project that uh, took an unfiltered system and filtered it uh, and we treated it um, as a result of uh, what impacts a fire would have. And, and there's really two different impacts that occur as a result of a forest fire. The immediate is the ash loading. Uh, that's actually relatively easy for most treatment facilities to deal with. Um, the secondary problem, is, which occurs usually months later, like now, uh, when you're getting large rain and snowmelt events, um, the depending upon that fire and, and how hot it got, um, it it can create uh, erosion problems that can last decades. Uh, and that sediment load can be a serious challenge for any treatment plant. Um, so, uh, you know, for, for our situation, um, it's not an immediate threat. Certainly as we move to the Willamette supply, um, you know, that it's it, the, the nature of the threat changes a little bit there. But all that to say is we do we do look at what's going on in these watersheds um, and we and it's part of what we do on a legislative basis as well is look to see, you know, what kinds of laws do we need to protect these watersheds um, and how who do we need to coordinate to make sure that we we aren't jeopardizing these supplies. Pete, is there anything you would like to add to that? I'll, I think you covered a lot of it, Tom, and, and I, I'm guessing that maybe the question had to do more with the sediment loading um, issue if, if there was a lot of logging in a particular watershed. Um, but to that point, you know, one of the advantages we have uh, with uh, the JWC system, which that, that watershed is a, a lot of privately owned timberland and there is logging in that watershed, but it also um, there are uh, raw water storage facilities in, in Hag Lake um, and also Barney Reservoir, and those act as a, a buffering to, to help trap um, some of that. If, if there is increased sediment in the runoff, um, a lot of times, you know, we're not actually using that water, drawing it out of the reservoir um, for, for many months in, until the summertime. Um, and even then, the, the treatment plants um, are capable of, of handling a wide range of turbidities um, and treating that water. Yes, it does add to the, you know, the sediment handling requirements. You, you've got to, you've got to get all that out of the water and then deal with it at the plant. But uh, we've got a long successful history, our partners do at JWC, of, of being able to treat a wide range of turbidities. 
OK, the next question is from Mike. What is the age of the majority of the water system and how long is its life? And uh, we're going to turn that over to Pete Boone again. Yeah, so our our system um, has been has been built uh, over time uh, and and really the 12th and Valley Water District uh, infrastructure uh, was largely brought together as a, a consolidation of, of many smaller water systems um, that were that were built over time. So we have infrastructure um, that dates back quite a ways. I'm actually looking at some information here now. Um, you know, we've got a lot of pipelines and, and even hydrants that go back into the 1940s. Um, and, and then, you know, a, as it's grown over time, we've, we've replaced a lot of those. Um, I'm just thinking back recently, my, my tenure here, I've been at the district for about 12 years and we've replaced um, quite a few miles of pipeline in that time. We've replaced uh, quite a few reservoirs and, and pump stations. So we're, we're always upgrading our system based on not only growth, but um, just you know replacement of those older assets and uh, making sure that, that things are in good shape. Um, now, obviously we, we can't uh, keep everything brand new. And so um, it's really important that we, we maintain those assets, but uh, we we've, we've got programs in place to to do that and to focus our our operation and maintenance activities on on keeping things in good shape. So um, it's it, I'm I'm looking at a wide range of of asset ages here, um, but a, an older asset, you know, a pipeline from the the 50s doesn't doesn't necessarily mean that that it's you know going to fail at a at a certain age or after it's been in service for so many years. Uh, has a lot to do with um, you know, what are the conditions that it's that it's in? You know, a lot of our assets are buried in the ground and and subject to corrosion and, and different things and, and ground shifting. And um, so uh, we we uh, you know, we we try to take all that into account when we're making replacement decisions and maintenance decisions. And um, again, our, our focus is, you know, maintaining a, a reliable water supply for our customers and and putting our putting our resources towards that goal. and. Um, so learning from you know which things are having issues and where do we need to where do we need to make improvements? OK, thanks, Pete. And we have one question here as we're finishing up. Sue, you mentioned discussions on rate increases for water consumption and or fixed costs. Do you have any idea which will be the most beneficial to help manage infrastructure costs? Also, what those rate increases might be? So we're going to give this hot potato to the CEO. This is chat. Yes. So um, great question, and and uh, I I wish I could give you a really simple answer. It, it's actually quite complex. Um, at rate rate making, uh, rate structure is uh, a science all unto itself. Um, but uh, I'll give you a, a fairly high level answer here. Um, when you take on a lot of debt like we are for the for the program, uh, though you th then result in high fixed cost and payments to pay those those financial obligations back. Um, it when you have those high fixed costs and payments, um, it doesn't make sense then to have a lot of variability in the um, in in your revenue and so you would want to raise the fixed portion of that uh, bill so um, how much it's really hard for me to answer at that point and that's why we want to do a whole rate study on this and and look at what those impacts are uh, and look at how we can make sure we're being equitable uh, about that um, in that distribution and we also want to consider the impacts that this could have uh, on our customers where it's already a challenge to pay uh, their bills. So uh, it's something that's going to need more study, um, but I, I would say from a, a, a percentage basis, the fact that only 23% of our revenue is coming in currently from uh, uh, the fixed portion of the bill, um, I would be much more comfortable with something above 30% uh, is where I would like to see us be. 
Um, I don't know if that's what the rate study will show. Um, the, the rate study might show that, you know, maybe that doesn't make sense for us. Um, the other little nuance here that, that I want to point out is just modifying that has an impact on your bill, right? So your fixed portion of your bill goes up and, and then the variable portion essentially, um, it may go up, it may stay the same. Uh, so um, that's where rate increases come in. So rate increases are can happen. You can have both of those happening at the same time where you have a rate increase and a modification to your rate structure. That's far more messy um, in terms of, of the impacts it has on, on people. Um, but essentially from the end user, from, from the customer perspective, uh, what you see is an increase, period. Whether it's on the fixed portion or it's a result of the overall rate increase, the entire thing going up, uh, it does result in an increase. Right now, uh, our board is in the midst of those conversations about what the rate increases, not rate structure, but the rate increases will be. Um, and so uh, they have not decided yet um, we are providing information to them uh, to, to try to make it so that they can make a, a, a well-informed decision on this. Um, what I think I can safely say here is that uh, the board and, and myself, we all believe what's really important is we try to find uh, rate stabilization and rate predictability. Uh, that that we can that when we have predictability, we can build around that, right? We can we can manage it. We can finance around that. Um, so uh, what we're looking at is trying to get uh, into a situation where we don't have this issue of you know rates going up, rates going down, rates going up, rates going down. But uh, and not to say that the district has been in that spot, um, but. Uh, we certainly are facing that right now where we had pretty low rate increases, um, but as a result of the decline in revenue, we are certainly seeing rate increases higher than what was forecasted prior. They were forecasting before about 3.6% a year. Um, we are certainly looking at something uh, well above that for this next biennium. Uh, but the idea is, is okay. Let's let's find a way to figure our way through this so that we don't have to go through this kind of uh, cycle again. Uh, but lots of moving parts. Stay tuned. Uh, you know, we are we are providing an enormous amount of information to our board members to consider on all of this, um, and uh, I, I know they have concerns about the impacts that it can have on our customers. Uh, so we're looking at all the options we have to try to make that increase as small as possible um, and, and make it something that is more predictable in the future. And I think that's it, correct, Andrea? We've got one more question coming in here at the very end, but it's just a thank you for this presentation. I wish more utilities would do this. I have more confidence in TVWD to work for its customers. So that came in from Mike. Maybe it's one of our water operator friends, but um, Melody also thanked us for making ourselves available. So uh, that's a wrap for today's edition. Well, thank you all. Thanks for joining us. And please, uh, you know, uh, Andrea said this earlier, we're, we're not afraid of tough questions. Um, we understand that things can be upsetting, confusing, uh, and and we we won't hide from them. Um, so please reach out, uh, let us know, including the topics of these forums. Uh, if there's a particular topic you would like us to go into deeper or more information on, um, please let us know, and uh, that way we can make sure that um, we're being responsive to what. Uh, is of most interest to our customers. So with that, thank you and uh, have a great week. Bye.